and Marshall Fields and all these different places. Those are the illustrations we did. So my background really is illustration. But like when Dwayne was talking earlier about, you know, trying different lines and doing the work, I spent eight hours a day, five days a week, doing lines on sweaters, ribs on sweaters. And then I did, those of you who remember pantyhose, I had to do pantyhose to, to take watercolor pantyhose down without getting a watermark. I kid you not, eight hours a day, five days a week. But the good news is for 11 years, I, I worked every day, all day long, drawing, drawing, drawing. The catch is I only used black and white because it was for newspapers and magazines and that's all they had. So um, I moved out to Tucson, Arizona, and they sent me fashion illustration for a while, then they dried up, they went to photography, and I um, learned computer and learned how to do graphic design because I thought it was great. And it's really served me well, and you'll see why in my paintings. I really draw on the idea of design when I do my paintings. Um, and then I still, I continued illustrating. I illustrated a bunch of textbooks and other things. And in about after having my own business, graphic design and, and um, branding, finally about 2000, I decided I was going to start painting. I got my master's in um, by interviewing Western artists who were former illustrators. And I became one myself. I really became a Western artist. So I've been painting since about 2000. I started out with pastels and then I went to oils and I was doing portraits. And my husband said, Jane, no one wants portraits. You have to do landscapes. And because I was a good wife, I listened to him and he was right. He did that. Um, so I started doing oil landscapes and I can honestly and happily say I learned it here at the Scottsdale Artist School. I took my classes here and the teachers were so wonderful that I was fortunate enough to pick up a lot of information and I started traveling all over the world and painting. And um, just in the last, I think since COVID, I was teaching some Zoom classes and I wasn't getting out as much. And besides that, my oil painting pack used to weigh 22 pounds. And now I carry two pounds. I'm going to go through my um, pack with you, which fits into this. Okay. And when I'm really traveling light, I just take this and I can do whatever I want with what's in here. So um, let's start with this. This is pencils. I always carry a little gouache. Can you show it to the camera? Here? Oh, oh, sorry. Where am I? Here. Okay. I always carry some gouache. I have two convenience colors: brilliant orange, and this is opera. This is a Windsor Newton. This is for Bougainvillea in Italy and everywhere across the world. And this is for some of the sails and some of the sunsets. I can't get them with some of my watercolors. I need these, I call them convenience colors. Um, I always have a little sponge. And my pencils range from Sharpies. Sometimes I'll just do no tans and Sharpies. These are the pencils I like to use. This is a really cheap Bic. This one is a Caran d'Ache. Um, really cool mechanical pencil. You put the um, the lead out. You can get it as soft as you like. I usually use like an HB or something really soft. And the reason I like this one is that this is a sharpener. Put this in here. And you can make it super duper sharp. Yeah. And I always carry a couple white gel pens because I am not and have never been. A traditional watercolor artist. I don't have the patience or the desire to plan. I really admire people who can plan the white space. That's not my thing. Okay, so I have to have little crutches. One crutch is the gouache, and the other one I'll show you in a minute. I carry this. This is from my oil painting kit. It's a small, um, I call it my opener, because the, the trick to gouache is to put those tops on really, really tight. It dries out really easily. 
it's not as forgiving as watercolor. So sometimes I need this to get in. One of my favorite little sketching pens is the Pigma Graphic. I like the number one. Got a great, um, it's a nib that goes thin or thin, or I can use the edge to make it thicker. I always carry a few of these in case they dry out. Um, I carry a white candle for resist. You know, it's like a mastic. And um, I might get, I'll try and show you that today. Otherwise, I'll, I'll add it at the end. And these are my brushes. It's all the same brush. I only carry this rosemary number 10 um, travel brush. It's all I carry. And you'll see how I use it later. But that's also why I work small because I can't go too large with these. This is how they look when they're newer, but I can get an edge, a little nice little edge, or I can get a huge swath of color with it. I'm really into simplifying. That's my goal. And then I carry a few Q-tips because sometimes um, I have to do a very technical thing called smudging and smushing. It's a technical thing. So that's those tools. Then I have um, another very cheaty kind of a tool, and that's white out. I don't, I'm not proud. I use white out. If I need white, I'm gonna go for it. The problem with that is once you put it down, the paint will not go over it. You have to commit. I'll show you how I use that. I have a glue stick because I'm always putting things in my sketchbook. I have these two little tools. This is sort of a framer, and this is um, something I use to isolate color. I make, I hand these out to my classes. I make these out of like file folders. It's a medium, like a number five on the grayscale, little square. It's about an inch and a half by an inch and a half. I punch a hole in it. And when I'm trying to isolate a color, so you know, sometimes you see something in the distance, you can't figure out what the color is. If you isolate it, you'll suddenly see, oh, it's lighter than or darker than the gray, and it's blue or green or purple or whatever. It's a wonderful little tool. Did you make that yourself? I did. I used it when I, in my oil painting kit, I carried a plastic viewer that you can buy, yes. but it's too big. You know, things have to get smaller. I always carry a couple of erasers, even though I don't use them very much. Pencil sharpener. Um, when I'm not traveling, I do carry a, a little knife because of the different papers I use. It helps me separate them. And this is my old embroidery scissor. If I want to cut things up, I have never, ever been, the TSA has let me take this through since September of 9-11, really, because I was traveling then. And it, it's so tiny. And it's just great for little trimming things. And sometimes trimming my pencils if I have to. Okay. Then it's like a magician's box. There's like never an end to it. This is my watercolor kit. And um, most of these are tube paints, to your point, that I have put in the little half pants. I fill them with the colors I like. I am very messy. And I, I it's okay with me, you know? I, I think of this character. Um, some little special things in my little palette. This combination, which is a raw sienna and uh, manganese blue and um, cobalt violet makes the most beautiful grays. So I always keep some of that in there. I have a variety here. I actually am using more of a limited palette. Today, I'm gonna to use a limited palette when I do my demo. Please, by the way, if you have any questions, ask right away. I have a big blob of this um, gouache white here because I use it pretty freely, even with my watercolors to lighten things. And Excuse me, what was that? The color that you just meant to beautiful gray? Raw sienna, uh, manganese blue. Oh, manganese. Yes, and cobalt violet, which is really yummy. It's a great color. And then I have a few, like a burnt sienna here, and this is a turquoise. I have a few extra little colors, a sap green. I don't use them all. I just like to have a, an option. Okay. Um, then I have 
when I'm traveling, I don't take this big pot here, although this is a great little device. I take either these two film canisters, one for light, one for dark. They, they were Fuji and they've been air, you know, watertight for, for years, 20 years, I bet. And that's one of the things you'll learn with gouache, water is not your friend. Watercolor, yeah, but with gouache, if you use too much water, you lose the opacity of it. You lose the whole point of using it. We'll be talking about that. I also have this little gadget, which I found, you can get on Amazon now, it's a, a scientific measuring device. And what I can, is there water in there now? Okay, you squeeze and the water fills up this little tube. And when you're done with it, when it gets dirty, you dump it and squeeze some more. And what I have done is I put little Velcro on the top, uh, both tops, so that I don't lose it. I hate chasing things around places. So this is really <laughs> it's funny, right? Um, and then the only other water I always take is a little spray bottle. This is a little whole vine spray bottle. I'm almost done with this. What would you, what would you have on a double bottle? How would you call it on Amazon? Um, you know what? Actually, I can give a list. Can I give you a list here? Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll, if you... Um, tell her you want it or something, if she has your email, I can send you a list of everything, okay? Just let me know you're interested and I'll send it along to you. Um, it's really the easiest way to do it. I just try to take a Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, I always have a color wheel. I am, I am always designing with color. Nature is so smart. If you look out at the cactus right now, like those little prickly pear that are starting to bloom, the green ones have red on them, right? It's a complementary color scheme. And the purpley ones have yellow flowers. Nature is way ahead of us. And I have found that the desert to me always has a secondary color scheme, which is, which is some sort of purple or red purple an orange and a green. If you look out of the desert, and certainly if you look at my demo, you'll see what I mean. And if you look at different landscapes or different subjects and try and push it towards some color scheme, first of all, it'll be a stronger painting because you won't have, you'll have harmony and you won't have a bunch of extraneous colors in there. And also, um, it's really design. It's, a, it's your I, as an artist, saying, well, I want this to be complementary, or I want this to be analogous. Maybe sometimes you'll just have greens, but it's a, I keep the color wheel to remind me about all that. I always throw in another little pad besides the ones I carry. This is, I like hot press. Um, I know most watercolors like some sort of tooth. I don't. I like smooth. And Phoenix, and then I always carry a couple gray markers in case I just want to do some value studies. This is a, um, there's a kind of a dark and a light, and then I can use black. Okay. Um, I do, um, so that all fits in this, and sometimes this is all I take. And then I will take maybe, I might take a sketchbook that's like this, which is pretty big for me these days. I often just take something like this. And I have this little, I found this little sleeve. You can make one. It's clipped right on there. And I make notes. This particular one doesn't have a lot of color in it. Oh, oops, see, there's the horses that ended up in that that I showed you. Um, but I have done, I have gone through countries and just filled this thing up with color of black and white. And that's all I did. Any questions? Yes. I'm just one going back to the, <clears throat> that soft lead over what? Yeah. What lead did you have in there? Um, well, I usually carry a refill on it. So it's usually an HP, HP, mm -hmm. which is middle, or even I, I might, you can sometimes get in a 60, which is even softer. The coolest thing about that pencil is you sharpen it 
And then do you remember in school how you used to dump out like charcoal and rub it and then you take things away with an eraser or you can do that with those little shavings. It's a really cute little pencil. It's, not, it's like $18, it's not cheap. I probably, um, I probably watched that better than I watched my phone. I don't know why. It was, was that a question? What, what, are you, what are you talking about? A pencil? That pencil. Yeah. $18 for a pencil? $18 for a pencil. Can you believe I spent that kind of money? Mm -hmm. Some raisins. It's a current dollar pencil that sharpens. Oh, that's the one you showed us. There. Yes. Yeah. And you can buy lead in any, it doesn't come with lead. You can buy whatever you want. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You know it has to be good if I spent that kind of money. Okay. Um, I think what I would like to do before we go to the actual demo is show you some of my work and talk to you about why I work that way, right? Um, as you can see here, sometimes I prepare, this is a, this is a, a four by nine, um, sort of a, a block that I have trouble finding these days. If you find them, let me know. I like it because I can do things like this. I can divide it up. Um, and sometimes I will take um, ochre um, and acrylic ochre and rub some on a, as a base with some water. I do it for a couple of reasons. First of all, if I'm working on a landscape, it's really nice once again to be um, going to the compliments. If I'm working on a very green landscape, if you put a burnt sienna under it, it's a really nice oil and it, comp it makes the green pop. Occasionally you'll leave it uncovered. Okay, um, Edgar Payne did that when he did the Sierras and when he did even the desert. Um, and sometimes I use this ochre just because um, it kind of personally covers that white. You know how intimidating white paper can be? It's really nice to start out with the color. It also serves, if you don't have really good paper, it'll kind of seal it. So you can use almost any paper. If you've got some of that ochre, the acrylic ochre, you can use practically any paper. Um, as you see, like I'll go out and I'll have it ready to go. I don't even mind the streaks, I don't care, okay? Um, then often, maybe I won't have time to paint something or I'm in a foreign country, I'm getting to know the light or whatever, I will just do, uh, you could call it a color wheel, but it's just kind of stripes. I will just do little samples of the colors that I see. And the advantage of that is when I go back, I may have some paintings, I may not. I'll certainly have a few photographs. And you know how inaccurate photographs can be? I can refer to this. This is the desert. Look how many greens there are in the desert. And this is my test, which, as I said, is a painting unto itself. These are the sky colors. These are the flowers and sunset. I'll have this to help me with a painting back in the studio. One of you asked if you ever, Grace, was it you? Do you do paintings from your sketches? I do. My sketches are very much um, destined to be paintings if I like them. For instance, um, this one, which is the barrio in Tucson, is um, Can current. You turn it right oh, side up because if you're reversing it on the camera, it's upside down. down. Oh. Yeah, so just oh, so I have to look at it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So this is the this is an actual home in the barrio in Tucson. This was um, I had this project, this hotel in Tucson, and the way I work is I I sort of submit I like a painting maquette, you know, like a sculptor does. You know, they do a little one and they get it approved. So these are my little maquettes. This painting was approved, and it is about twenty four by twenty four. Um, this is something I did with Judy. We were at McDonald's Farm. And I think you saw my sketchbook. I did a little black and white of it first. Um, this is another painting for that hotel. This is for the guest room. This one ended up being 24 by 36, maybe even a little larger. And um, who was asking how? Oh, wasn't you, Grace? You said when you try and make them bigger, they don't work. 
I guess it's me that's always asking these questions. I hope so, because they're good questions. So one of the classes that I have taught is how to transfer a small painting to a large painting and not lose the spontaneity. And there really is a way to do it that's quite easy. Um, this is another one from a different project. This is, um, this is also like, I don't know, 32 by 40, 30 by 40, something like that. This is, um, I, I just had fun with it. I just decided to write a bunch of desert words and then I painted over it and they accepted it and it's a really nice big painting. So if I hadn't had the advantage of the gouache opacity, I probably couldn't have done this because I wanted the layers. And this one, I think you saw the larger one out here that went to Australia. Turn them right side up. Oh, <laughs> it's terrible. I'm going to turn it this way. Um, this one is right out here by the Western Art Museum. There's a row of these cactus. And I sat there on the curb across the street and just painted them. Um, I don't work large. I like my small brushes. I like my small kits. I, this is about probably as large as I'm ever going to get. Which way am I? That way. Okay. Um, this is just some flowers in my garden. This was done right here. Down, in fact, I think I was with you during, I think you're down there by Old Town. And as you can see, the, having this tone behind it was really helpful here and letting it show through. It gave it a glow. So you, you put that underneath your watercolor paper? Okay, that's, On the watercolor paper that's, before anything that's else. Acrylic. Acrylic, acrylic because then, I don't want it to lift. They hit, of course. And then do you try to save your whites or that, that color is painting not look like a white? It's not. Oh, yeah. It's a little lighter there. Yeah. You can it's see. Really nice. But it works, right? It's a little touch of sun. This is actually I did this over Judy's. This is just a um a floral that we did with some beautiful flowers on the table. And here's all my different colors, and then I did a little sketch. But I mean, you can see where I, I did do some watercolor, and then I went over it and carved into the shadow with the gouache, which I can only do because of the opacity. Here's another one from the Desert um, Botanical Garden, and another garden picture. Oh, this is, this is kind of a beginning. I started to do... Um, some prickly pear. I was playing with the colors. I didn't get very far, but I kind of like it. You know, it's not overdone. This is a picture of one of my favorites. Unfortunately, it's a terrible shot, but you can see it on my um, on my Instagram. This is um, a painting of the Saguaro East in Tucson at sunset. Remember, I told you about my colors that I have to take my convenience colors. It's because of things like this. I can't get these colors with an ordinary palette. I is need... that upside down? Is it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. Um, this is just, it's a bad print, but I needed these convenience colors in order to really grab that sunset. I have a question. Do you, when you're painting that outside, do mm -hmm. you put those uh, samples as you're working or say, I wonder if that's going to work. Or... You mean the, the little, yeah, these little things, sample. these things? No, so, the colors on the side of the painting. I, well, unless I'm working as I'm going to work today with an actual palette, I never have a palette. This is my palette. Okay, so you test it out there before you put it here. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I just wanted to show you that all of these I can use this as a little palette on my lap if I have to. It also carries extra paper, carries all sorts of things. But you know how sometimes when you're out painting, there's no place to sit or you're sitting on a rock. And this is um, kind of a nice little um, way to not only carry extra paper, but also to have a surface. So I do that when I'm out painting. Okay. Uh, any questions? No. Okay. I'm going to, um, I just want to show you this. This is my dry opaque uh, carrier, I guess. And I have the names on here. 
that am I upside down? Yes. I don't know why I'm having such trouble with it. I have the names on here because as you'll see, my colors are so dirty. I can't always remember what they are. I'm sorry, that's just me. But here's you can see they're kind of crappy. You um, take two colors, takes a lot of paint. This is probably a two beach. And I fill them with my favorite colors. And that's how I did most of those with this dry wash and the little watercolor kit, all right? Today, and the reason I'm not showing you this today is because it's very, very frustrating. The dry colors, the darks dry lighter and the lights dry darker. And yeah, it's, it's something you have, that's why you sort of have to do those little color tests to get a feel for it. If you do it long enough and often enough, you'll, you'll remember that. But I thought I'd give you a break today and I'd show you the wet wash method because it's more what you see is what you get. Okay. So this is the this is the scene. And I can't tell you how beautiful the flowers have been. Have you, has anyone gotten out there to see? Right? Yeah. You know this doesn't do it justice. All right, right? So it's really, I'm really happy that I'm gonna to get to paint this before that vision leaves my head because the, the picture is never, that's why we're never gonna be out of business as artists. The pictures are never gonna be able to express what we see. Um, but this is at Granite Mountain and there were poppies and lupin and there were even, there was a start of some mallow, some orange mallow. So this is what I decided to paint for you today. And I've made this like a four by six. I've already, um, oh, I do carry some tape in case I want to change the size of something, but I've made it into a four by six with masking tape. And I'm going to take out my watercolors in case I need them, but I don't think I'm going to use them. This is how I carry wet colors. This is so cool. It's called a Stay Wet palette. Notice it says wash because I can use this for acrylics too. Um, it comes in all different sizes. This size is the most convenient for me. And I didn't, I worked on this the other day and I wanted you to see how colors get a little film on them, but they really keep them wet, which is incredible because it, these wash things dry as fast as watercolors. Um, so I wanted you to see that there is, the way this little deal works is, there's a sponge, you wet the sponge, and it has directions when you get it. And there's this palette paper, it's stay wet paper, it's thick, you can't hurt it. And I could scrub this clean and use it again and again. And then you put your colors on there. Um, and I'm gonna be adding colors, I'm using a limited palette. Um, and I will, paint this little scene for you. And I have to have my little sponge. Okay, so I've made a complete mess already. As I said, I don't take this big thing out when I'm out painting much. I use it in my studio. And I like it because I can keep, I don't have to change the water. Do you use the same brushes for your watercolor and your brush? I do. I do. <clears throat> yeah. I if I were doing anything bigger than this, I'd have to do a bigger brush. And I don't, I don't think these are. I think these are synthetic. I used to think they were stable, but I don't think they are. They're only like eleven dollars. Cheap. Okay. So I'm gonna put out some paint. I brought a whole bunch of paint. And that's the only disadvantage. That's why I usually you work dry when I'm not going to because I don't have to carry paint. I just have to carry this one little thing. So I have a big tube of wash. It's just like oil or anything else. You're going to use a lot of it. You have a preferred brand? Uh, good question. No, not really. I just don't, um, I don't use student grade. Buy the best paint you can afford. Don't buy Winton and stuff like that because it just doesn't have a pigment in it. You're wait, I feel like you're wasting your money. 
Is that wash or is that? This is wash. Okay. This is a titanium white, just as I would titanium use for oils. Mm -hmm. And then this is my pretty much my oil painting palette too. This is an alizarin crimson. Put a little more there. You don't need much. And as I said, I'm really tightening these because wash tends to dry out. Um, cat orange, I put it on there because I'm doing flowers. Ordinarily, I wouldn't need it with my limited palette, but I'm gonna put it out there anyway. A little more of that. And so this palette doesn't have any wells. No, no, you don't need them. You'll see how I work with it. It's not like watercolor. It's not watercolor you use it? No, it's wash. It's an opaque watercolor. Now, these are the wells if you want it. And you can do this wet also, Grace. You can fill this out and use it immediately. And also, if you put this top on it, it'll stay alive for a little while. But basically, it'll dry out, which is not bad. I've painted hundreds of paintings that way. But sometimes it's fun to use a wet method. And as I said, I think the thing I like best about it is that the colors don't change. So this is also my go-to color. I told you I was going to use this. Yeah, boom. <laughs> okay, this is CAD. Um, this is cat. Well, this is permanent yellow deep, which is basically cat yellow deep. I'm sticking that over here. I learned about this when I was in Italy. Cad yellow deep and permanent rose, which I did not bring today because I don't need it, make the most beautiful flowers in Italy. And also, it makes the stucco buildings, those glowy, gorgeous stucco buildings. Um, my lemon. I'm not kidding about making this tight. It really makes a difference. So I'm using lemon yellow. And yellow ochre. Well, yeah, yellow ochre, which is just like a modifier. Just kind of tones things down if I need it. My all time favorite green, which is Viridian. And oh, well, I don't know why anybody wants any ultra moon blue. I have a lot of it, I don't use it anymore. <laughs> okay. And that's it. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven colors. I actually, in oils, I've got it down to four. But why do I limit the colors? How many? I just, you know, sometimes you add all these extra colors and you can't understand why the picture isn't looking serene or beautiful or the colors aren't working. It's because you've got such a mix of cools and, and warms that it's fighting. All right, so keep it simple. All right, so I'm gonna um, keep the horizon line high on this, but I don't know if you can see it. There's this little slice of the mountains here, and they're very blue, and I really I like those a lot. So I think I'm gonna make sure I get that in this picture. And I'm probably going to keep that, this cactus, but I'm not going to put it as close to the edge here. It makes me nervous. Looks like it's falling off. But I am going to do a little cactus there in the ground and maybe, maybe this guy. And um, I do like these little bushes, the way they're coming and going and giving me slices of the sky. 
Now, ordinarily, if this were a big painting that I was doing like an oil, I would do a very serious thumbnail, like a two by three. I might do four of them to see, do I want it vertical, do I want it horizontal? But for the purposes today, we're just gonna go for it. There's this really great path coming through here. And I like the way I get to see a little of the ground there. And it opens up again here, and there's a little spot here. There's some darks that I want to remember here, coming along here. This really cool bush kind of hides the path there and makes it kind of flatten out and go back. Another little bush there that I like. Oh, and I think, see how there's a little bit of, I think actually, I think I like. I'm going to move this cactus. I'm very seldom erased. I don't like this. I want this cactus. I want it to have a, a road coming in here too. So I'm going to move this cactus up a bit. Okay. Um, I'm looking at a group here. And what I'm looking at is how can I make this landscape go back. That's perspective. It's going to be bigger shapes of color here, and they are going to reduce as we go back. And that's going to naturally give me that feeling of perspective. Um, I think the most important thing that I want to remember here is that here are my puppies. Some here. There's probably some here see some way up here and I see a few here and I think um, when you start a painting sometimes I even write in my sketchbook what do I like about this because you can get seduced by all this other stuff and you forget so I'm going to write copies and if you've been out in the desert you know that this picture will never give you the same feeling, right? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and capture it. Now, when I paint in oils, I always put my darks in first. Watercolors, this is why it's so hard for me to switch over. Watercolors put their lights in first, is that correct? Right? And you build on top of that. So I'm going to take a little watercolor page here. I'm going to, I'm going to, describe those poppies and kind of lock in those poppies so I don't lose them because it'd be really simple to forget where they are. So I'm really just going to swash in some, splash in some poppies. Sorry, Kira. <laughs> <laughs> Won't be the last time or the first time. Okay. Now, you know, as things go back in, um, perspective in atmosphere, you lose yellow, yellow falls out. So I'm going to mark these back here, but I'm not going to do them in the bright yellow. I'm going to do them more of an orange. And I'm just going to mark a few spots where I want to make sure that I have some copies. Okay, that's just to remind me. That's what I want. I am swishing out my brush, but I make sure I really dry it when I'm done on this little stupid sponge. That's all it takes, really. Um, I think, um, contrary to most watercolor, I'm going to work from the back to the front. Is that right? I mean, okay. So, first of all, I want to find this little ridge, this little piece of the mountain here. And if you look, and especially if you look through one of your viewers, if you hold it up and you look at the mountains, they are so intensely blue. The reason is because there's so much atmosphere in front of them. There's a thing in the distance. There's no yellow, it's blue. <clears throat> and you can push that as an artist, it's beautiful. When people start painting, they often try and make them oh, gray or green or whatever, they're blue. You can add some green, you can add some other colors, but basically, 
If you want them to go back there, they're going to be blue. Maybe not this blue. Let's take a look here. I'm actually going to add a little of my, uh, there we go. Add some wash to that. Got a little room for some sky. That's it. That's all I really need. I can always come back and describe them more, but I think that's all I need. And then if I'm going to do Do these bushes first, and then I'm going to do the sky. So, no, on second thought, I'm going to do the sky first. I don't want to muddy it up when I get to the bushes. So, my experience with sky is it's often kind of pad on here the bottom, and it goes to um, Viridian, and it goes to Cobalt. And when it comes to the top, the curve of the earth is ultramarine. We're not going to go up that far. I'm actually, I've decided I'm just going to use this um, viridian with, with the white. Just give me that sense of their sky. I feel like it'll be very harmonious with the rest of the colors that I'm using. And it'll describe it really well. So using this fresh wash, yes, you don't have the problem of the colors when you're wet bleeding into one another like you did with watercolor. You won't keep them separate. Well, that's a good point. I actually am using it pretty dilute with some water, so it's not completely opaque. When I get down here, you'll see I'll use it straight out of the tube. But now I'm watering it down a little. It's more, I'm not watering it enough, so it's going to um, mix. And it, the best thing is it's not going to change color as much because I'm using them from wet. Ordinarily, if I put this down, you can see it's getting a little darker because there's some water in there, right? Um, but not as bad as if I were just using um, dry wash. So I'm gonna start doing some dark leaves. And for that, I'm just doing um, one of my favorite combinations is cobalt and um, ochre. It's a little too dark, but see, when I get it dark like that, I'm going to use it somewhere else. I don't like to waste it. So I'll put some darks in there. And then I'll lighten it. And get the shadow side. Okay. Yes. Can yeah. you just buy the white and use your watercolors as it becomes gouache? Yeah, except, yes, that's a really good point. And that's essentially, I didn't even realize that what I was doing all those years, that I was making my own gouache. But um, the, the watercolor colors are more intense in one sense, but not as... Um, uh, it's you have to explain, you have to play with it yeah. because I do use it, but when I'm using watercolors with gouache, I'm constantly having to lighten it, lighten it, lighten it, lighten it. The watercolors don't have enough so you pigment. Have to light, so. Well, the, the watercolors don't have enough pigment to really keep the color true. You just, yeah, it's it's a really good question. I think I was doing it all these years, but I was, it's not pure. So the gouache is going to be your go-to if you want to keep the colors pure. I hope that helps. Let's see what this is. Yeah. Make this lighter. Is that a cobalt that you have up here? Is what? Is that blue or cobalt blue? Cobalt blue, yeah. It doesn't it looks like the cerulean of watercolors. Oh yeah, no. Um, yeah. Well, She's that would be more there. Yeah, but it's also you know cerulean is more yellow. It's warmer. You know, I use cerulean in Greece 
that's a great color for the Aegean, but not for not for the desert. I'm adding some more yellow to this green because it's getting kind of dead. I don't want it to be dead. And I think you can see I'm using the side of the brush and getting some nice coverage here. Add here. I think um, the first stage of these paintings, they seriously look like abstracts. Because I'm just trying to get a bunch of color down there. So this green for these back here, I make it, I'm making it cooler. I want it to recede, so I'm not making it terribly bright. So I'm also going to want to describe the lupin and the mallow. So I'm going to get those colors in there now. The lupin is kind of a purpley color, purpley blue. Because I want to remember where those are too. I don't want to forget them. So I'm just going to get some notes of that in there. So the way you're using the stay wet palette, is that what you would also typically do on the side of the painting when you don't have that? Yes. Because you're actually mixing the colors there and then picking it up from the side of your paper and adding it to your painting. Yes. And you know, I can tell you there are times when I don't do this at all if I've got this. But um, I seem to, I, maybe it's a confidence thing if I can put it here first to but just check it. To use that as your from the stay with yeah yeah i think it's just habit for me yeah. um but that's what you do in the field too and that's mm -hmm. you don't have to have a mixing area no no mm -hmm. because you pay for and that's why it. when i was using just watercolor for so many years that's why i could get away with that because i don't need those big mixing areas sure there's some in here and then I really want to remember, I want to remember that there are these, and you can hardly see it in there, but I remember that it's there. I want to get these mallows. Those are these really pretty bright orange wildflowers. And I especially love putting them next to the blue. Once again, compliments. They really pop when you put them next to the blue. Mm -hmm. Did the original ochre was put down the first? How long does that take to dry? Two minutes. Okay, so you seem to be careful to not cross your things you put down. Yes, is that careful to what? Um, Go into what you laid out with another color. Yeah. You know, not well, to go over one of what you already put down with another color. Yeah, because right now I'm trying to just cover it. Just trying to get it it's all not covered. For reasons of it's not dry yet. No, okay. no. Mm -mm. Well, some of these are, you know, the, the wet wash does take a little longer. So if I were to go over this, it would smear. But I'm, I'm, it's really, well, see, these are already dry. Right now I'm just trying to get. Get them all covered. So, in in light of that, I'm going to work a little faster here. Oh, we're good. Well, 
not so good. I think, um, as I described the perspective, thinking of the landscape as going back into bands helps you with your perspective. So I'm going to do a nice little light band here. And then I'm going to go cover up the back of it. Can you get can you get lost that you could uh, just wash? Yeah. Good question, Grace. You can go back and soften them. Yeah. Um, the thing about gouache that I really, I think maybe that's what I love the most, is that it's never, it never really is done. That's why you have to put them under glass, because if they get water on them, they'll, they'll break apart. There is something called acrylic gouache, which I have never used, but that is more like acrylic. When you put it down, it's done. Yeah, not this. Um, all right, so one of the things I see that I'm going to need to do here is I need to get that uh, little path in there, I think. And if, um, if I had burnt sienna or something, I would just throw that in, but I'm going to have to kind of make my own. So I'm afraid this is getting dark. So I'm just going to kind of describe this path part coming in here. Have it come down here. Maybe there's a little touch here. Remember, I said I wanted it to actually take you all the way here to this cactus. And it's probably going to be a little bit. I just want to block that out so I don't forget it. And actually, I can use a little of that mixture to get this back in here. A little bit of warmth in there, I think, is going to help it. Let's see how that works. Yeah. When you get back here, it's kind of ugly. The thing I love about gouache is when you get when you get a color you're not happy with, you can just go over it. So I'm describing this piece here, which is almost like a purple. It's in the distance, so it's not going to have all that yellow in there. And it's going to give me that final little band before you get to the mountains. And did you purposefully leave that little band in there to keep the colors from going together? Or um, I just kept it there because I was waiting to get to it. I mean, if you'll notice, um, I do. I'm talking about between that color you just cut on in the blue of the mountains. No, actually, I'm going to be doing some of the green here. Yeah, okay. yeah that's exactly what I'm doing right now. Um, I, I wish I wish I could have you like come up and feel the paint because uh, even though I'm swishing it in the water, when I'm actually when I actually have paint on my brush, I barely touch the water. So these would not run. They're pretty opaque. Okay, they're pretty solid. It's such a difference from water. I know. And honestly, I think that's probably why I love it because I feel like. It's more of a, a an oil type of a thing. I'm familiar with the working with the opaque with the um, the consistency of it. So please. And I think what I what I think happened here, too dark. It's coming forward too much. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Right? So I'm gonna leave the base and I'm just gonna put a little color on top of it, which will dry and will feel like there's a little sunlight on it. Is watch more forgiving than watercolor? 
in the sense that you can go over your mistakes, yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. I mean, watercolor, it's down, it's down. I guess you can layer, right? You can layer to some extent, but wash, as I said, is like working with um, more of an oil. So if I want to invest in wash, those are the colors I should use. Let me go um, I think it's a good place to start. I think like anything else, you're going to be seduced by <laughs> all the pretty colors. The thing with gouache is, um, Grace, it's, um, I think the first thing you should do is maybe get this limited palette and play with it and figure out what you can do and what you can't. Because, I mean, you're always going to want a few more colors. Let's face it, we are who we are. But I think if you start small, and get a feel for it and learn how to mix them, you'll be happier. I'm adding a little light on these two. I just think it needs. Okay, so we have to finish this up. Here we go. Let's see. I'm going to um, fill in these greens and then I'm going to describe these poppies, get those in. You know, it was interesting um, when Dwayne was doing his um, sketch, he made the point about lines. And I think as a, that was one of the biggest differences with the way I paint as opposed to sketch. I understood his lines and in fact, I'm gonna do his line, you know, little boxes to practice because I think that's great. But I think it shapes, okay? I think like this is a triangle, I think. Um, this this little bush here is going to be a circle. I think um, thinking in shapes helps me not get bogged down in trying to find it, what it looks like. All right. So um, it's kind of a different approach. I think it's the difference between uh, painting and, and sketching, right? Painting is about shapes, I think. Lines too, but um, there's sort of a different approach to it. I think too that um, as artists, we do have to kind of play games. We have to, we, after a while, we know what works for us, right? To keep us on track or to get the job done. And um, everybody has to find what works for them. So I'm just going to fill this in. I want this green. There's that bush that I really kind of liked. I want to put some darks next to these poppies because they're not going to pop. You know, if you're having tr trouble getting something light enough, put something dark next to it. That's a little rule of thumb. Often it's not the light, it's the dark. So, I'm just going to describe a couple of these little poppies. So you were producing a little painting to get the petals? Yeah. Because I found that if you all you need to know is that the poppies have like four or five leaves. I don't know exactly. But I know when a teacher once taught me that if, if you have a field of anything, just describe a couple of them and the eye will fill in the rest. 
actually true. And then I'll you notice I'm painting over a lot of the blue ones, but I'll come back and get those in a bit. Can you put light over dark in gouache? Um, to some extent, yes. If you keep your paints thick enough, yes. Yes. And I'm really happy about that. We're over. Sorry, Vera. <laughs> okay, we can do that. Oh, okay. So I'm just going to put a little, to your point, Grace, I'm going to put a little lighter yellow in here. I think it's going right. This, I didn't realize it took me so long to do this. I did this the other day and it was maybe longer than I thought. I think I'm gonna have to show, I wonder if I can, if I can show you a painting that I finished. We have five more minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me do this because I think this is going to take longer. Let me show you. I'll show you this. <laughs> We're having the best time. I'm going to show you how this would end up in another half an hour. Can mm -hmm. you can you text it to me? Yeah. And then you can put it up. Yeah. Great. Here, tell me you probably have it. It's downloading it. Okay. Play. Yes. You can put it under the camera there and show it. Yeah, but it's kind of small. Oh, or you can come up and see it, but you're just going to put it on the, on the. Oh, is that the photo? The original photo? No, that's from this painting. is the photo. This is the painting. Oops, there it went. Okay. Oh, did you get that? Okay, so we'll just pass it around. And you can see that I have the basis here. Um, to what extent do you, when you're done, try to clean that towel at all? Um, you can literally just take some paper towel or whatever and just clean it up. The thing that I um, haven't tried to do um, with my oils, I would make mud and save it. Maybe you could. I don't know if it would stay wet, but. But like you would use turf on a lot of these. Use water, water. just water. Okay. Yeah. Oh, but but well, that'll stay wet. Pan. You can always just take the sheet off. Is that a pan? 
It's individual sheets. I mean, you can actually even put these sheets in the dishwasher. You know, and, and you know, put the stable cover on it and keep it wet. For yes, a while. yes. And honestly, um, I this is a pretty new piece of paper. I kind of like it when it gets to this color. It's like working on a gray palette, you know. So I have no problem with that. But is this a different painting? This is how this is going to turn out. I just, I'm sorry, it just took longer than I thought. It's beautiful. Thank you. But can you see the bases here? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's going. Yeah, take a look. Nice. Yeah, it looks nice. Yeah, please, yeah, come on up and look at it. Yeah, yes. The color is just doesn't, you know, but you can see where this is going. Let's see how you describe those foreground pockets. Well, here you can really yeah. see them here. Uh -huh. yeah. I just made a few little notches, mm -hmm. and then I painted around them and put some stems in, which I was just starting to do. And this is a pad of watercolor. This is hot press. It's a block. Yep. But you can peel off. Yeah. So you put your knife in there. Oh, here, this is this is the best thing about this stupid thing. There, um, this happens to be arches, but arches, yeah, arches, not this. And like I said, a lot of most watercolorists, I think, actually like the cold press. They like the tactic. But yeah, come around and look, because I didn't realize how often it was over there. Sorry. Is this the Granite Mountain Trailhead? Yes. Or? It's from Granite Mountain to the scenic view. That's the best loop right now. And this was taken a few weeks ago. I was there last week, and it was, I mean, the, the mallow is going cuckoo, which it's not, there wasn't as much there. Yeah. You take bootlegger to scenic view. <laughs> Did anybody have any other questions? Any thoughts? How long did this one take to complete? Honestly, I didn't think it took an hour. Maybe I was just talking too much. Well, <laughs> you didn't start how big, how until big was this? Until well, that's hour. true. I didn't. That's true. Because I don't think it took more than an hour. Because you spent the first half hour showing us the other thing. That's right. That's right. How Thank you. Is this that's what I'm saying. It, it probably only took about an hour. It, it's the same size. Yeah, it's yeah. a four by six. Here's the thing. Because I'm used to painting in plein air, which I did for many, and, and so on, you only have a certain amount of time before the light changes, right? And, you know, especially at the end of the day, it changes so quickly. So you, you learn to move fast. But, you know, if I were to take this home with me and that photograph, I would have enough to do this. Oh, yeah. So I have the information. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you try this stuff. It's fun. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Right. At this stage, you can really see the depth. Yeah.